Good morning and welcome to the 14th meeting of the Public Audit and Post-Legislative Scrutiny Committee in 2019. We have received apologies from Anas Sarwar this morning. I'd like to welcome David Stewart, who's attending in his place. Item number one is decision on taking business in private. Do members agree to take items three, four and five in private this morning? Agreed. Thank you. Item number two is Audit Scotland planning for outcomes. And I'd like to welcome our witnesses to the meeting, Caroline Gardner, Auditor General for Scotland, and Fraser McKinley, Controller of Audit and Director of Performance Audit and Best Value from Audit Scotland. Um, the Auditor General won't be uh, making an opening statement, so we're going to move straight to questions, and I'm going to ask Alec Neil to open for the committee. Thank you. Auditor General, can I start with a, a sort of general question? Uh, I refer you to Exhibit 1 in your report on page 3. Uh, there are 11 national performance framework outcomes which the public sector and its partners work towards. <coughs> the first one is Grow Up Loved which then goes on to say safe and respected. Uh, the third one is uh, a creative and diverse cultures and so on. Tell me, let me take grow up loved. How on earth do we measure that? I think I should start, convener, by saying that clearly the national performance framework and the outcomes in it are owned by government itself. And as the committee knows very well, it's not my job to comment on policy. Um, my view is that it makes perfect sense for any government to be aiming to set um, more strategic, longer-term outcomes for the services they provide, the things that government can do, rather than focusing on inputs, the number of nurses or uh, police uh, employed in public services. Um, and that the Scottish Government, I think, has been notable for its ambition in the outcomes that it has set for itself over the last 12 years now, since the original National Performance Framework in 2007. Having said all of that, you're right that um, it's important that um, not just setting outcomes is the be-all and end-all of the National Performance Framework, but that the Government has um, a robust and consistent approach to planning for how it wants to improve those, those outcomes through its own actions, through those of other public bodies, and through the other um, ways it can influence and leverage things that will have an impact on the outcomes. Um, the briefing paper before you today is called Planning for Outcomes, because that's, I think, what our interest is in, whether we can look at what government does and see a clear line of sight between the outcomes set out in the National Performance Framework and, for example, the strategies that it's developing, the legislation it puts forward, the money it's investing in both capital and running costs of public services, and all the other things that government do. Um, the two that you've pulled out are the, the, the higher level, um, more uh, less tangible outcomes, if you like. Um, the government, um, I hope, will be in a position to articulate how it's doing that, and I'm sure it would point to things like the care review for looked after children as part of that. Um, our paper is setting out the challenges of making sure that its approach is more consistent and more embedded in everyday policy making, resource allocation decisions, performance reporting and monitoring. But let's take the example of looked after children. Uh, we can measure whether they are getting well looked after. Uh, we can measure, at particularly you know, in later years, what their destinations end up being to see if they're ending up in the employment market with as fair a chance in life as everyone else. We can measure their educational outcomes. We can measure their health outcomes. How do we measure whether they've been loved? You're right that some things are easier to measure than others. One of the things we say in the paper is that an outcomes approach, and particularly the way the Scottish Government is implementing that, means that they need to be more innovative and perhaps take more risks in a managed way, not just in um, the ways they uh, plan to improve outcomes, like the one you've pointed to, but also how they measure them. Um, and we talk towards the end of the paper about the importance of um, asking, in this case, children themselves what their experience is as part of the measurement framework. It's not the only part, but I think it is another part that's important, particularly for the sorts of outcomes that um, are included within the latest national performance framework. So if you take children, for example, growing up, um, and you want to audit whether the government has achieved its aims and, and outcomes in the national performance framework, 
how do you measure? I mean, I realise one thing you can look at is the opinion of children. But we don't, children can't tell you if they're more loved than their predecessors or less loved than their predecessors. Therefore, we don't know if we're measuring progress or regress. So how, as an auditor, do you measure whether the Scottish Government can improve love? Our starting point is to look at whether the Scottish Government has set out um, for each of these outcomes, first of all, how it plans to improve them, and secondly, how it will know whether it's succeeding or not. And as we say in the paper, that means they need to have um, some baseline information, they need to understand what the gaps are in that, and they need to be going through that, that cycle um, of uh, setting how they plan to um, measure what's improving or not, doing that and then tweaking their plans as needed. This performance framework is now 10 or 11 years old. So surely in the last 10 or 11 years, they have defined how they measure whether they're achieving you know, greater love or not. I think the, that particular measure. That. I think that particular measure is a that particular outcome is a newer, newer one in the latest version of the national performance framework, which, as you know, is now set out in legislation. More broadly, as we say in the paper, um, we've seen some examples of good practice, but equally, we think there is room for it to be much more embedded in policy making and performance reporting, um, and that um, although there are examples of good practice, that's not consistent. But, but do you not agree if you have meaningless guff like this, it's going to you know, destroy any exercise of any credibility before you start? I completely agree that the value of having a national performance framework is not in setting the outcomes themselves, but in doing the underlying work, which is about planning for how you expect to improve them and then monitoring whether that's happening or not. And for some of these outcomes, it's definitely more challenging than for others. Okay. Um, I think we've got yeah, right. a good okay. chance at that. I'm going to bring in Willie Coffey. I'll come back to you, Alex, and let you deal with your device. At Willie Coffey. Thanks, convener. It's sort of continuing in the same theme, and it's really to ask you, Caroline, who, if anyone, is doing any work to try to make sure that targets or outcomes are meaningful for us. We've heard that it can be pretty aspirational on one side and it can be very prescriptive on the other, where we demand that something is reduced by a thousand by such and such a time, you know, specific targets. Who's doing any work to say whether the targets we've given ourselves collectively are actually achieving anything for us and achieving the outcomes that we seek? And is there any work being done to try to review and refine this sort of process? Are you the person to do it, or should it be government? Uh, I think it's for government to do it, but Fraser's been involved in the work that's underway at the moment, and I'll ask him to pick that up. Um, thank you, Caroline. So there's a lot of work going on at the moment, Mr Coffey, and indeed last week saw the publication of this report, Scotland's Wellbeing Delivering the National Outcomes, which was the first report of its kind, which is trying to pull together, not on individual um, outcomes, but a broad sweep, if you like, of progress that's being made against the against the national performance framework and the outcomes taken. Mr. Neil's point that in various iterations this has been around now for for some time, and so uh, particularly in this latest iteration, which was um, launched last June, a lot of work had gone into looking at not just the outcomes but the 81 measures that sit underneath those outcomes to make sure that they are meaningful and they are actually telling us something. There's absolutely no doubt, no doubt just to pick up Mr Neil's point as well, that some of this stuff is difficult to measure, it's difficult to audit. Um, I think it takes us into territory of um, hearing stories and personal testimony from people and recognising that as legitimate evidence both for measuring progress but also for us as auditors. And we have, we have dipped our toe in that water, we did a report uh, a couple of years ago in self-directed support, for example, and a lot of that report was based on us actually going out and talking to people who were receiving services in their own homes and getting a sense of how that was uh, of how that was going. Now, that, that in itself isn't enough for us. We would always need to, in the jargon, triangulate the evidence with more quantitative stuff. But I do think that, um, bearing in mind this is a, a kind of joint government and COSLA uh, enterprise in its latest iteration, there's a lot of work going on to make sure that um, underpinning the 11 outcomes, which are, in a sense, a statement of intent, aspirational, as you say, um, that actually we can we can have some sense of of progress. I think our challenge, as Caroline says, to, to government and councils and all partners, really, is that too often we still find good and strong statements of intent and vision, but not enough of a plan as to how they're actually going to get delivered. Mm -hmm. t t take, for example, supposing a particular target isn't met, and I'm sure we could come up with a few... <laughs> 
Does anyone look at the people who, who, who didn't reach the target or meet the target or get the thing delivered on time and so on and so forth to see whether there was a positive or a negative outcome for them who missed out on our target? And by that, that, that's what I mean by do we review what the targets actually mean for us? Because uh, if there was no, po no negative outcome for people that didn't meet the particular target, why have we got the target? That kind of review process in outcomes and target setting, is that what's contained in that piece of work to look back at whether the targets themselves are appropriate? Shall I pick that one up? So, yeah, so it's an interesting question. I think, so when things aren't going as planned or targets are being missed, then yes, I think there is a, I think most of those will be reviewed. I think what is tricky though, to come to your point, and this is something we mentioned in, in our briefing for you this morning, is that the accountability systems around this are quite difficult because almost by definition, these things need to be delivered by multiple organisations and multiple people. So, so I, I genuinely think the days of saying you were responsible for the delivery of that target or that outcome solely is, is quite hard to do these days. Now, that can be very frustrating, I think, for the public, for you as you're you know, doing, um, uh, doing your scrutiny work uh, on these kinds of things because it can be quite difficult to point to a single person that's accountable for the delivery of that thing. So I think our accountability systems need to catch up with an outcomes based approach because I do th I also don't think it's acceptable to say well nobody's responsible for it that hasn't worked we've missed a target therefore it's some kind of systemic thing we need we need to be sharper than that I think but there is a tension in there I think because I also see the opposite effect which is accountability systems that actually encourage and drive people in the public services to do things that actually aren't necessarily in the best interest of outcomes they're in the interest of their individual organisation. So there is a tension there that I think we need to surface and, and, and grapple with. That's very helpful. Thanks. If I can try and draw an example of the point Mr Coffey raises, I think Anas Sarwar raised a question when we were looking at children's ment or adult mental health as well, and he asked very specifically um, if there was um, a, um, a, if somebody had counted and there was evidence of um, suicides by people who were on a mental health waiting list and I think that kind of example goes to the heart of Mr Coffey's question are there um, are there terrible outcomes for people whose you know government targets haven't haven't been met so is this is something that the committee I think has touched on in in different evidence sessions um, I'm going to bring in uh, David Stewart uh, thank you, uh, convener. Uh, Under General, your uh, report mentions the importance of meaningful engagement with public sector workers. Could you provide some best practice examples of that? And I would refer members to my register of interest from a member of Unison. Um, I think um, we see examples of this on a small scale in most of the performance audit work we do. Um, for almost all public services, I think the quality of the service that's provided depends on the quality of the interaction between the person receiving the service and the person providing it. Um, and we see repeatedly um, really good examples where uh, public sector staff, workers of all sorts are encouraged to listen to what's important to the person they're providing a service to and to look at meeting their needs. Um, we published a report a couple of years ago on self-directed support and there were some very good examples where people would sit down with um, a person with disabilities, listen to what would make a difference to them in their early lives and really think how they could use the money and the other resources at their disposal to provide very tailored support that gave people the best outcomes and helped them to develop their own independence. We also though, saw people who either weren't being encouraged to do that, um, weren't uh, trained to do it or didn't have the flexibility themselves to do more than provide the services that the council already had available and the difference between those um, for the groups of people affected was like chalk and cheese um, that was one of the key recommendations in our report that councils needed to understand better the approach being taken locally and to make sure people were trained supported and had the resources to do what was needed and to listen to the voices of people being affected um, 
very often, though, we, we sort of see it from the other end, from um, third sector organisations that we're talking to as part of our work, and we do a lot of that engagement ourselves. Um, so we um, spent some time as a leadership team within Audit Scotland talking to people from the Wheatley Group about the way their housing services um, have got a think yes approach where they're looking to meet the needs of people locally, and where they can do that through um, the flexibility of the housing service itself or things that they can easily put in place, that can work very well. Um, we were told of an example of um, a gentleman with very severe hearing problems who had the television turned up loud enough to the extent where he was disturbing his neighbours and the housing officer was able simply to buy a pair of wireless headphones that meant he could hear the TV and the neighbours weren't bothered. Equally, we heard examples where what was actually needed was some involvement from the health service or from social care services and it was much harder for the housing officer in some circumstances to engage the local public services in saying what is it that this person needs and how can we best meet it and it's that kind of consistency and flexibility and innovation that um, I think is needed to make a reality of this which takes us back both to the, the um, culture and the ways of working that we talk about in the paper and the sorts of evaluation that Fraser was talking about about listening to people and whether what matters to them is being delivered. Nobody's saying this is easy, it's clearly complex but those are the things that can make a difference. I mean, I think these are some excellent examples. And I think, it, although it's simplistic perhaps for me to say that people on the front line sometimes know best, I think this is a truism across Europe. Um, certainly the criticism sometimes I find at surgeries and talking to the public is that you politicians, as a general criticism, they would have, you know, come out with policies, but you're not really talking to people on the front line. And without making a party political point, which I, of course, would not do, um, if you take issues such as workplace parking, um, uh, there's clearly some controversy among public sector workers, which I'm a member, as you know, uh, about the issues like that. Now, while you cannot, Audit General, talk about what, uh, the policy per se, is this a kind of example where talking to frontline workers in the public sector or indeed the private sector first before developing policy would be quite helpful. Um, without getting into the specifics of the workplace parking levy proposals, um, I think in general um, governments tend to come up with better policies by talking to the people affected by them consistently, not, not as a one-off consultation. Um, and the Scottish Government has made some serious commitments to that through its membership of the Open Government Partnership, um, through the community empowerment legislation, um, through the approach to public service reform, which is, engaged, which is built on participation as one of the four um, pillars of going back to the Christie report in 2008. Um, again, I think it's an example of where it's not the aspiration which is in question, it's the consistency of following that through. I think finally, because I'm conscious of time convenience, I mean, there's some examples uh, in other countries, such as in, uh, in America, about looking at townhouse forums to discuss policies. Uh, I think... Uh, I think Mike Russell's looking at some issues around citizen phones and so on. I mean, is this a development you've perhaps picked up from other European countries that we could look at more carefully in Scotland? Um, as you say, the government itself is, is um, investigating lots of this. I think Fraser can probably give you a picture of what we see from some of that, um, from the work he's been leading. Yeah, so I think we see it in lots of different guises, uh, Mr Stewart. I think there's um, the, the whole kind of citizens' assembly thing is clearly one version of that, and we see lots of good community engagement locally. I think I think the challenge, though, is getting that engagement much earlier in the process. I think, because um, as you know, I do a lot of work in councils, and, and I think a lot of councils are very good actually engaging with communities and service users when they when they themselves have an idea of what they want that service to look like. The challenge is in, is in involving people much earlier in that process, and I would include um, staff in that. So before decisions are made, before proposals are made for cons for consultation, an earlier conversation that says actually what's important to you, what really matters to this community. And and my experience is that when, when organisations do that, they are very often surprised that it's not necessarily the thing that they thought was going to be the answer. Um, so I absolutely take your point about very often I think the answer is lying as close as possible to uh, to the frontline service delivery, if you like. All, all outcomes in the end are, are local and to some extent individual. So that's where that's where I think the, the whole community empowerment and engagement agenda is, is obviously headed, uh, and I think that's the next challenge, is to do that much earlier in the process. Thank you. Thank you. Colin Beattie. Thank you, Vera. Well, John, I'd like to <coughs> link it between money and performance. Um, in the 2017-18 uh, report on Scottish Consolidated Accounts, 
you recommend that the Scottish Government prepares a performance report that clearly links the financial resources outlined in the consolidated accounts. Now, the briefing uh, does discuss this, and it uh, talks about uh, the Scottish budget should be clear about uh, how spending contributes to specific national outcomes, and we've talked about some of the difficulties of defining the national outcomes. Uh, you may recall that when the committee raised this issue with the Scottish Government as part of its scrutiny of the consolidated accounts, the Government indicated it would provide, uh, it would include brief material in the consolidated accounts and signpost individuals to more detailed sources of information. What's your view about that proposed repro uh, approach? Um, you'll um, be aware that um, the, all of this work is rooted in the recommendations of the Budget Process Review Group, recognising that making a reality of the national outcomes means investing uh, money and other resources, and that we need to be able to track how that's doing to um, either continue investing or reinvest somewhere else if it's not having the desired effect. Um, I think that um, we are very clear in Audit Scotland, um, in line with the Budget Process Review Group recommendation, that there needs to be a much clearer link at both the budget end of the cycle and the financial reporting end of the cycle um, with uh, performance, with the outcomes that government's planning to achieve and how well it's doing in practice. We're also clear that that's not a simple thing to do. It's complicated uh, for a number of reasons that we outline in the paper. Um, I'd be very relaxed about the government signposting in its financial report to um, the information which is held somewhere else. Um, it's always a challenge to make sure financial reports are accessible to readers, um, that they're not overburdened with detail, and that the high-level messages um, are clear and apparent to readers. My concern would be that the, the signposting was clear, um, and that's easier to do these days with technology allowing you to make very direct links to different sources of information and that the information that it was linking to was um, fair and balanced and rounded. Um, we give an example in this paper of where um, the government's reporting of its performance can sometimes highlight the positives without highlighting the things that aren't working so well. Um, and that obviously has the effect of limiting parliamentary and public scrutiny and making it harder to stop doing the things that aren't working um, and reinvest in things that are more likely uh, to have the desired effect on outcomes. But the approach sounds fine to me. It's the detail of how you implement it to make it accessible and make sure it is giving you the rounded picture that's needed. Just expanding on what you've been saying there, do you think that approach is sufficiently transparent on how spending is directly leading to improved outcomes? Um, I think it is as long as the um, other parts of the package are in place. So if the budget is very clear about um, which outcomes uh, financial investment is intended to improve and how it's expected that that will happen, it's quite straightforward at the end of the um, financial reporting cycle to link back to that and say this is what we expected to do and link forward to this is how it worked out in practice. But it does need to make that link across the whole budget cycle and as I say the information does need to be rounded rather than selective and simply pulling out the things that are working well. It needs to show the whole picture. Isn't there Fraser McKinley wants to come in on this. If you can be just on that point, Mr. Beatty, if I may. So I think it, there, there's, there's a couple of things. I think the, the Budget Process Review Group got to a point of saying trying to trying to identify specific budgets for each of the 11 outcomes is a, is a difficult and probably not terribly helpful task because of the interrelated nature of them. And I absolutely sign up to that, having been involved in some work some years ago to try and do that. It's, it is difficult. I think what isn't good enough, though, is that if you take the, the Children and Young People's Mental Health Report that the convener mentioned earlier, we just don't know how much money spent on that. We couldn't tell you. And that's just not good enough, it seems to me. So it seems to me that we, we, we should, and I think this is the direction of travel, it, rather than trying to do it as an abstract exercise of what's the budget and what are the outcomes, a more practical taking a, play, a thing like children, young people's mental health, figuring out what the collective resource is that's being applied to that, um, and you could pick any other numbers of topics that we've reported on over the last few years. I think we had a similar discussion about economic growth and trying to figure out how much money was actually being invested in, in economic growth, and we just don't know. And so that, for me, is, is absolutely critical, because if you don't know, and I think, for example, this, this report that was published last week on delivering the national outcomes is a good report and gives a very good picture of progress, places that were doing well, places that we're not doing so well, but money doesn't get a mention anywhere in this report. 
So we do need to be better at joining the two the two things up for sure. I think, as Caroline says, there are lots of different ways of doing that, um, and it is going to be difficult, I think, to get you know a single bit of paper that sets all that out for people. Um, but it does seem to me a big gap because, apart from anything else, it's quite hard to make a judgment about well, where should we be investing more money? Part of this conversation has to be about shifting resource from one place to another to make a bigger difference in, in the delivery of outcomes. I was actually about to come back uh, to Fraser McKinley's comments previously about the complexity and the number of uh, uh, different uh, uh, elements that come in to achieving a particular outcome. Is it actually possible in all cases to be able to identify the stream of money that's going into that particular service or whatever to achieve that outcome when there are so many bodies looking at different aspects of it and putting money in in different areas. Would it not be a case that you get to the point where you're tying yourself in knots trying to figure out where every pound's going? So, so yes, I think you do get to that point eventually, but I think my, I guess my point, Mr Beattie, is that we're miles away even from starting that process. So there's somewhere in the middle, I think, between basically not really knowing and, and spending forever trying to tie down every individual pound and pence and where that came from and, and who's responsible for it. So we're not expecting perfection in any of this, but I do think, um, and, and as we say in the, in the, in the report, these, the money is a means to an end. It's about allowing government and their partners to make decisions about where we should be investing the money. And in the absence of a decent understanding of how much we're spending on things in the first place, that's a very hard thing to do, it seems to me. So given the work that's been done by Audit Scotland, would you say that it should be possible for the government to identify at least the broad stream of money that's going into that particular area and to measure the outcomes directly against that, given the fact that there'll still be anomalies and gaps where other uh, entities and so on are spending money into that as well? So it'll always be a flawed process, but what we're looking for is just the general thrust. Is that, is that crudely correct? Yes, in short. And, and actually, we find ourselves doing that quite often in our, in our reports where, in the absence of available data about spend on a thing, we, we do some uh, analysis and some... And, and it's based on assumptions. And I think as long as, the, as long as the assumptions are reasonable, it gives you something to work with. Uh, Fraser McKinley has touched on the point I wanted to raise, so I'm going to come in with it now, but it's on the point about data. Um, the committee has, has looked at this across a number of your reports, Auditor General, and I raised this with the First Minister at the Conveners Group with her just a couple of weeks ago. Um, I think the most stark example of this, Fraser McKinley just said, was the ch Children's Mental Health Report, where we discovered that we had no idea about how much in total is spent on children's mental health. There was no data on the outcomes specifically, um, and there was no uh, data on why referrals to um, children and adolescent mental health services were rejected. And where there was data, it didn't seem to be consistent across the 14 health boards. It didn't seem to be shared in, in any way. We've also discovered in self-directed support, there's a lack of data. And very worryingly, on the early years um, and childcare uh, report, you told us that there was no business case made, despite the fact that there were huge amounts of public money going into the increase in hours for childcare, but no kind of sense from the government of what that was expected to achieve in terms of outcomes. So these are three examples. I suppose my question to you is, is it even more widespread than this? Um, and given the era we're living in of big data and evidence-based decisions, can you give us a sense of, kind of where the Scottish Government are in terms of making evidence-based decisions with our money? I think that's a really important um, question, convener, and very timely, as you say, given that the um, approach to information is moving away from the need to collect it as a separate thing to it being generated by the things we do in our everyday lives. You, you can see that in the way Lothian buses trackers work. They know where the bus is, and you can tell when your bus is going to arrive. We don't seem very much to be using that approach in public services. I'd pull out one more very important example to the handful you've given us there, 
have reported a number of times about the slow progress being made with the government's um, 2020 vision for health and social care, um, of helping people to spend much more of their lives well cared for, healthy, happy at home, rather than relying on acute hospitals for their care. But most of the data we've got about health and care is still about acute hospitals. Most of the political focus is on um, what's happening to the amount we spend on the NHS and on waiting times for acute services. And there are big gaps in some of the basics around health and care in the community. Um, we're just finalising our work on the uh, primary care workforce planning um, and the government doesn't have um, good information at all on the number of GPs around the country and the amount of care that they're able to provide. Now, without us knowing that, it's very hard to be able to genuinely plan for how you can avoid hospital being the, the first resort rather than the last resort for people who are just about coping in the community. Um, and those gaps are things that ought to be relatively easy to, to capture. It, we ought to have better information about how long people are waiting for GP appointments for how much um, primary care practices are able to avoid people being admitted to hospital unnecessarily or to get them back home again quickly. So I think there is, um, as part of making a reality of the outcomes approach, an important question for government about how it is using um, data and digital capability in exactly the way you describe to get more um, nuanced and more real-time data about what's happening across the country rather than relying on the old approach of quarterly data collection and publication. We can move well beyond that now, and that's not built into the outcomes approach well enough yet. I mean, your report says that the, uh, the Edinburgh Parallel Computing Centre and Scottish Administrative Data Research Partnership are doing some work at the moment on data to see if we can match with the performance framework outcomes. Do you know how far advanced that work is? I think Fraser can tell you a bit more about that, and it's worth noting that that's a big part of the Edinburgh City Region deal, is making it a digitally enabled area. Um, so there's work underway. Fraser? Um, I'm not sure I can tell you that much more about it, if, if truth be told, but we can certainly follow up in writing convener if that would be helpful. And I guess I would also say that that's an example. There are others. The Glasgow University have, I think it's called the Urban Data Centre, which which does similar kind of work. So as well as the, as well as the issue of there in some you would think pretty obvious places, gaps in our in our data and understanding. It's also an issue of the data not being terribly well joined up and people having access to different sources of data and making sense of that um, at, a, at a level that they can really make a difference in terms of the outcomes. I mean, I know this perhaps sounds a bit techy. I just think it's such an important point. I think in 20 years' time, we're going to look back and think we were just putting a finger in the air to decide how much money is spent on certain initiatives um, in the public sector without the evidence to back it up. I mean, there's even a front page uh, article uh, in the Herald this morning on exactly this, that the EU Commission has withdrawn money from our public services in Scotland and it said that uh, Skills Development Scotland do not have rigorous enough controls over how the money is spent and what is achieved with it. And I think that goes right to the heart of the, the EU Commission have obviously decided there is no evidence of outcomes in the money that's been spent in Scotland, so they've actually just taken it away. Would you like to address that point, Auditor General? Um, the committee will be aware that we've reported on um, problems with the management of EU funds, um, both the structural funds and the... Um, uh, agricultural funds in recent reports on the Scottish Government and we'll pick the detail of that up again in the report that's due to this committee in the autumn. Um, but in general terms you're absolutely right that that chain of money from Europe um, through to the Scottish Government and onto the bodies that spend it is very important in accountability terms and the money is there for a purpose as, as all um, public spending is. I guess it, I, I'd like to sort of pull the frame back and say we're not talking about just um, funding that comes from Europe for particular purposes or just new announcements from government, the, the money that's focused on um, reducing waiting times. We're talking about a budget of about £42 billion a year now and the way all of that money is spent is crucial to improving outcomes or not. And um, I think what Fraser and I are saying is we'd like to see a much clearer line of sight for how that's intended to improve outcomes and obviously we need the data for whether that's working or not so that we can um, fine tune and make adjust adjustments as needed. I mean, it's maybe a bit of a wake-up call for us that the EU Commission's decided that Scotland's clearly so poor at 
evidencing how that money is, is contributing to outcomes, that they've just decided to withdraw it altogether. It maybe gives us a wake-up call for, for that in the rest of our spending as well. In principle, you're right. I think it's a bit more nuanced than the picture you've described. I think that the funding is um, in suspension um, and uh, in interruption, which are technical terms that the EU uses until it receives the assurance it needs. But absolutely, in general terms, government, um, to make a reality of the national performance framework, needs to know uh, what it intends to achieve with the funding it provides and whether that's happening or not. Okay. Thank you. Liam Kerr. Thank you, convener. Good morning. Uh, it's really related to the same point, uh, and very briefly, I would say, uh, despite a commitment to an outcome-based approach that we're reading about, one of the things that comes from your report is that performance still seems to be measured uh, on inputs an awful lot, or certain areas of the public sector are measured on inputs rather than the outputs and the outcomes. Politically, is that going to change? Um, a difficult question to ask us when it, I think you're right that it is in some ways a very political, both small p and big p problem. Um, I, um, I think the government's approach is the right one. Um, I said in response to Mr Neil's first question that um, whatever you think of the individual outcomes in the national performance framework, it has to be right for governments to be focusing on the big challenges that they're countries their societies face and how they intend to tackle them um, <clears throat> and those challenges tend to be long-term things that require um, that joined up strategic approach so um, there's widespread consensus that the approach is the right one um, and as we say in the paper there are real challenges to making that a reality um, making the commitment in some ways is the easy step the hard one is is doing the long-term difficult work um, of actually improving the things the government has set out as its aspirations. One of those challenges, no doubt, is politics. Um, I think if I sat down with every member around the table, there would be broad agreement around most of the outcomes in the framework, around people being healthy and active, around us being well-educated and, and the, the things which lie in there. And um, on a Thursday lunchtime at First Minister's Questions, the challenge is to come back to the short-term things um, which are not working well and will under any government of any complexion, rather than progress towards the longer-term things. I think um, it would be um, better for everybody involved were there a clearer uh, line of sight, uh, direction of travel between where we are today and where the outcomes are. I think that would make it easier to focus on the long-term changes that the government is looking to see as a country. Um, but equally, there is a role for politicians to ask themselves about where the balance of advantage lies between today's political um, advantage and the longer term changes that individuals and parties are looking to see. Thanks for that. I appreciate that. It's quite a difficult question for, for, for you to answer. And it, it's just on the same point, because I think that people watching this will, will be asking themselves this question. I mean, in, in paragraph 12, you talk uh, really in similar terms to, to that which you just have, Auditor General, about long-term outcomes may bring difficult decisions into sharper focus. Uh, and you give an example of uh, health moving more to a community setting. Now, bluntly, that could hurt in, in the first instance. That, that's going to require some big decisions. It's going to require some brave decisions uh, before the outcomes actually improve. And so I think the question that will be in people's minds is, uh, is that ever going to happen? Is that realistic, given the political environment, the electoral cycle that we find ourselves in? Do you have any thought on that that you can share with us? Um, I do, and I'm sure Fraser will as well in a moment. Um, I think there are two things. One, I do understand why this is so difficult. Um, I've come out of a, a BBC studio on the morning my report on the NHS is published talking about the need for shifting care from hospitals into the community um, and then had an opposition spokesperson going in after me who will say quite frankly we know you're right but we have to we have to be um, criticizing moves to downsize hospitals or close wards or whatever it might be i understand why that's difficult and it makes that shift harder you know that as well as i do equally i think to say that um that means it's never going to change as a council of despair, really, that, that um, it is right, in my view, to be taking that longer-term view of what government and what public services are for. 
Um, one step in doing that is to set out the outcomes that government's looking to achieve. And as I say, I think the thing that, that helps to move that along is putting more of the rigour underneath it about planning for how you want to improve the outcomes and being accountable for what's working and, just as importantly, what's not. Um, there will be political knockabout going on in there. We all know it's a rough old trade, and it, to, to an extent, that's what politics is about. It's about making those sorts of um, disagreements uh, public and, and um, accountable to the public. Um, but. I think having that longer-term picture in mind has to be one of the things that makes it more possible. Fraser, you'll want to add to that. The, the only thing to add briefly, Mr Kerr, is I think that's why the stuff we see and hear about engagement with communities is so critically important, because that's where the conversations really need to happen. And that's not about you know, government or health boards or councils just going out and doing a sales job. That's about having an honest conversation with people in local communities that, that explains the rationale, the evidence base for a decision, why, what the alternatives might be, to come back to Mr Stewart's point about the people locally knowing what the alternatives might be. And that, that I think, too often doesn't happen. I think the first that communities hear about it too often is, our leisure centre is going to close. And if that's the nature of the conversation, then of course people are going to be up in arms about that. Um, it's about having the conversation much further upstream to explain what the challenges are, what the alternatives are going to be, and therefore, in that context, those kind of difficult decisions might be more palatable without without recognising that any of this is easy. My final point, Kavina, would be at a national level, because I think interestingly these these same principles apply in, apply in very local places as well as ultimately for Parliament and making some big decisions about, for example, it, it looks like by the end of this parliamentary term, something like 50% of the Scottish budget will be spent on the NHS. And at what point, as as a country, do we think that's okay or not? I mean, that, if we continue that trajectory, I think we need to be talking about the impact that that might have on uh, on other on other places. So I make I make no policy view about that, obviously, one way or the other. But it's the kind of, as you say in paragraph twelve, that's the kind of big discussion and decision I think that needs to be taken and looked at by government and ultimately by parliament. Thank you, Bill Bowman. Thank you, convener. Morning. Um, just to go back to the beginning, what Alec Neil was saying about. Um, Growing up loved, safe and respected, so you realise your full potential. Now, um, I think probably I've conventionally stopped growing up and probably grew up quite a long time ago, so as a large proportion of the population probably did. So maybe a lot of us fall out of this, I don't know. But how does the Scottish Government know if I've realised my full potential? And how do you audit it? <laughs> How do we Thank know Bill Bowman's reached his full potential? Uh, I think I'll resist the temptation to personalise that and instead talk about the um, outcome within the National Performance Framework as it's stated. Um, I, I do recognise the challenge that you and Mr Neil are putting to us, and I think to a great extent it's a challenge to government rather than to us. Um, it's for any government to set its own policy. I think it's a good thing that the Scottish Government is doing that in a longer term way, which is focused on outcomes. And I think what flows from that is a requirement that they can say how they will measure um, whether that's being achieved or not, and upstream how they intend to achieve it. If I turn it round a little bit, and the discussion this morning, you, you can see perhaps clearly where some people have not met the outcomes and we um, put resource to try and help them. But in the um, potential side of it, there could be a, a large amount of unrealised potential that we're missing out on by maybe focusing on the more obvious aspects. Have you any suggestions how we might tap into that? Um, I, I think one of the things that we say in, in this paper, um, which is a, a truism, is that there, there may be trade-offs between outcomes. That if you make a decision to uh, prioritise one set of um, things within society, by definition, others are going to be less of a priority. And, for example, picking an example we pick up here, there may be a trade-off between economic growth and sustainable development, between emissions and, and the um, environmental impact of all of that. Um, what we are suggesting needs to be done is more surfacing of the trade-offs there um, and then more clarity about the way that the, the thing that takes priority is being pursued in terms of the investment of money and time um, and how progress will be tracked. The, the particulars in here are clearly a matter of government policy rather than something that I think we can defend for you. That's not our job. What we can say is that if these are the policy government has set, 
this is what we think needs to be in place in order for this committee and the Parliament to be able to do its job. Yeah, thank you. Only briefly. A couple of quick things. In the report that came out last week, there's a whole series of, of indicators around realising the full potential um, thing, Mr Bowman. Now, none of those in themselves will be able to tell you whether an individual has fulfilled his or her own potential. But I think when you look across the suite of indicators, a lot of which are about inequalities. So it's about inequalities between where you live, between you know your socioeconomic circumstances, whether you're a boy or a girl or a man or a woman, whether you're disabled, not disabled. And all of those things taken together can give you a picture of whether, broadly speaking, people have the opportunity to fulfil their potential or not. If you're if you're narrowing, so there is a wee bit of a leap of faith in, in all of this, I accept, but if you're narrowing those gaps of inequality across all of those measures, I think you can argue that more people are more likely to be realising their pool potential. Thank you, Mr. McKinley. Willie Coffey. Thanks again, uh, Convener. Uh, Auditor General, I wonder if I could ask you about the performance improvement model that's in Exhibit 3 in the, the document, and I, I think I tend to ask this question every time that we meet. It shows a kind of cyclic process for continual improvement there. And the key part of it for me is the review part, the study part, uh, after we've done a thing to see whether we've done it well and so on, and also whether we've met targets, objectives and so on. Do you think that's been consistently applied across the public sector? Is there enough evidence to support it? And do you think there needs to be a bit more perhaps um, requiring the public sector to demonstrate that they do this? Uh, I agree with you. I think this is a, a quite a simple but quite a powerful way of um, taking the next step from uh, agreeing now in statute the National Performance Framework. We have in the paper here a couple of examples of where it has been used well, and the most notable example is probably the patient safety um, framework, where there are um, real advances in some important things that um, affect and protect people's lives being achieved by disciplined application of this framework. And we also say it hasn't been consistently applied. Um, the conveners highlighted uh, two or three of our reports where um, some of the uh, early stages about being clear about the scale of the problem and how you will measure progress weren't thought about at the beginning. Um, and if you don't do that, it's impossible to know what effect you're having and therefore whether you should do more of it or try something else instead. It, it's that um, consistency and rigour that I think we're looking to see. In that part of the cycle, the cyclic process, the review part, do you think in there should also be the bit that I was talking about earlier, thinking about the targets and objectives and outcomes that we set ourselves to see if they're in fact appropriate? Mm -hmm. Do you think? Uh, yes. Does, any, does answer, anyone do? Yeah. Does anybody do that? So, um, I think there's something for me about timing and all of that because I think, particularly in relation to outcomes, of course, these are these are intergenerational things. I mean, these can take 30, 40, 50 years, and. And I think there, there is a risk in the, in the discussion about outcomes that there's a general sense that we'll wait 30 years and see if it's worked or not. Now, clearly that isn't going to work. It certainly doesn't work for us as auditors. So, so I think that cycle needs to work, not exactly in real time, but I think what we don't see enough of, Mr Coffey, is, is that kind of cycle, and in particular the review bit, happening as they're going. And I think particularly not your point about whether actually the intended objectives were set in the first place. Again, I think that's sometimes when the politics comes into play, if I'm honest, I think, because sometimes that will require people to say, yeah, do you know what, we thought that was what we were doing, but actually we we're going to shift that a little bit. And trying to have that conversation in a way that isn't defined as a U-turn or a kind of failure or something is quite tricky. Um, but, uh, but this model is actually effectively step three of the three-step model that we describe in paragraph 19. So what's equally important is steps one and two, which is really about setting out clearly what it is you're trying to achieve. The second step they talk about is creating the conditions for that to make sure that everything's in the right place. And then this is actually about operationalising it. And as Caroline said, um, not consistent enough, I think, would be our assessment of that. OK, thank you. Thank you very much, both of you, for your evidence this morning. I now close the public part of the meeting as the committee moves into private. Thank you.